It's a guy jeans podcast. John, how you doing? I'm doing great, guy. Yourself? I'm doing good. Although we uh, we had a really good uh, friend pass away this last week, and uh, TK, and so I want to cheers him. Cheers, to TK. Yep. And everything he did for all of us. Yeah, absolutely. So that just happens to be a, an organic leashless beer, and that's who I'm here with. I'm with John from Leashless Brewery, and uh, want to talk to him all about. Uh, what he's got going on here and so let's let's start with uh how'd you get into brewing beer i like drinking it <laughs> yeah and uh it's kind of a, a long-winded story but at, at one point I, I worked um for the university of hawaii sea grant college program in american samoa and I, I i met the girl that i was gonna marry and we moved back to the country right before the 2008 um Great recession and we were on a tight budget so i thought it'd be cheaper to make beer than to buy beer and that that was not true at all it ends up getting a very expensive hobby <laughs> and then one thing leads to another and i thought well we, we should open up a brewery and um we did and the focus was the, the, this is the first brewery in ventura this the, this is the one that you opened yes yeah, so okay. the, the, our our main location here in ventura is the first one that we opened okay um and we chose to be organic because that was the lifestyle we were living anyways. And we thought, well, well, by we, I mean me. Yeah. I thought, well, if, I, if we're going to do this, it has to embody all of our personal passions and goals. Because that's what beer is, right? It's a, it's a passion thing. Um, so we decided to make it surf themed, which is where the word leashless comes from. It's the idea of surfing without a leash. Okay. Old school style. Um, and we chose to be organic because we, that's, again, that's how we live. Uh, mm-hmm. and at the time, there was like maybe less than 20 breweries that were certified organic in this country. And now we're maybe like up to 30, but there's like 10,000. Yeah. So it's still a very, very small number. Wow. Um, we lost a few during the pandemic, but uh, mm-hmm. nonetheless, yeah, we, so we decided to be organic. And also we had to make some beers that were safe for my wife to drink. So she's got a food allergy to gluten um oh. if her sh- if shampoo has wheat in it her head goes numb really? lotion has wheat in it, it her skin goes numb so um that, that's how sensitive she's so we, we make beers that can one be certified organic and contain less than 10 parts per million gluten so all these beers these gluten juice beers that we make we send them out to get tested before we sell them and we've got the process wired down now after seven uh-huh. years you would hope yeah um and, and so it's you know between and, and our love of music as well. So we kind of wrapped all these things up in a package and called it Leashless Brewing. And uh, we turned seven this year in July. Um, oh, congrats, man. Yeah, it's pretty it's rad. It's a big we're, deal. We're stoked. Um, keep putting out more beers. We won Ward last fall. Our Double Hazy won bronze at the San Diego International Beer Competition, which we're really pumped on. Dude, that's awesome. And... Uh, yeah, we're just trying to stay ahead of the game, make the best beer we possibly can, and we do it our way. So we, I really love Belgian beers. We have a whole category of beers that are Belgian style. Um, the pills in which we're drinking now, mm-hmm. a blonde, a Belgian triple, Belgian saison, Belgian quad. We really like our Belgians. But Southern California, so we also have um, EMTs running, like they're doing right now. <laughs> and uh, We're live, man. Yeah, we are. We, we're actually, for all, of, all of you listen to us, we are live in the brewery right now. We got some... Yep. Some beers being conditioned. We have one beer fermenting and, and finishing up, and it's just a lively place. I have, I have questions about all that. So, how do you how do you come up with the taste of of the beer, and also how how do you go about making it organic? And I I, I mean for those that don't know, how, how does that go down? Sure. So let's let's talk about the organic thing first. Yeah. That's the premise of what we do. So, certified organic means that whatever you're buying, uh, to either eat directly or in our case to process and to make into beer. It was gonna be cultivated without the use of GMOs, without the use of inorganic fertilizers or pesticides. There's no human sludge involved, nothing's irradiated. Essentially, it's an old school way of making an agricultural product. If there's a, anything that has to be made from a bench top, like a laboratory thing in its application, is, is a no-go. So for us, um, our beers can take twice as long to make. Um, 
and that's fine because it's, yeah. a, it's a cleaner product. It's better for the farmer. It's better for us. Organic agriculture uses 30% less water than conventional. Really? It uses 40% less energy, and it sequesters around 40% more carbon in the soil. And a lot of it's just because the way the soil builds. Um, with organic ag, you end up getting this nice, rich humus layer, and it's like a sponge, so it could hold a lot more moisture, so you oh. don't need as much water. Now, right now in California, we got a lot of water. Yeah. But five years from now, that may not be the case. Right. Um, it's kind of like a no-brainer when you when you want to talk about like fighting climate change and introducing carbon emissions. If we all just ate organic, that would nip it in the bud very fast. Um, it's a very simple change, but nonetheless, so we work with certain vendors to provide us grains that are certified organic. Our hops, our yeast, has to be certified organic. Um, if we use certain certain brewing salts, we have to confirm that it's been mined and not made with. Um, GMO bacteria, like for example, a lot of the magnesium sulfate or Epsom salt you get mm -hmm. is made in China and um, they just get sulfuric acid and blend that with magnesium and fry the whole thing down and clarify it and dry it out and there, there's your salt. So we can't use that. So we have to come up with different ways to make sure that our IPAs are have a nice clean crisp bitterness up front mm -hmm. and it kind of fades away so the hot flavor and aroma can pop. And um, you know, it, we we do what we do because we believe strongly that if you want to be a sustainably, sustainably minded business and you deal with agricultural products, there's no other way to really be sustainably minded unless you are organic. And it has a ton of challenges. Just last year alone, we lost like four hops. Hmm. We gained two. Um, when you say you lost the hops, does that mean you can't brew that specific beer that you normally brew with those hops? Uh, essentially, yeah, essentially. Yeah, okay. um, the, the farmer tells the broker, hey, we're not growing this anymore. And this is the last yield, oh. and then that's that. Okay. And they're gonna transition that acreage to something else. Oh, okay. Um, and that's fine. I mean, part of the, the fun of brewing is to be creative. We are musicians in a liquid format, if yeah. you will. Um, <laughs> Good. <laughs> and, and sometimes you just wanna make sure the product's the same time and time and time again. But like, for example, the pills that we're drinking, I, I, I tweaked the, the malt a little bit brought in a brand new Belgian yeast strain. And after five years, we figured, hey, let's, let's try and fix an issue that we keep seeing with this beer that we want to make it better. The same thing with our West Coast IPA V-Town. We, we just had to, by getting rid of those hops, we had to rethink and add in some of the, the standards like organic citra and mosaic to kind of help cover um, mm -hmm. the flavors that we were losing when we lost those other hops. And the beer is better now. So it's it's that idea like you know when one door closes another one opens you just have to go find that door okay so i guess my other question is, is okay so like you're you brew these beers and you get the flavors going so then you taste them and you're like oh that doesn't taste quite right now you got to brew it again and and go about that process right is that how you guys do it or do you taste it and go the first time and go oh man that tastes killer let's call it this so <clears throat> The, the, the recipe formulation process, you kind of, a, a good brewer knows like what their malt tastes like and what the uh -huh. hops taste like and, and can kind of conjure up an idea of how they want the finished product to be. Okay. And they could take all their historical references, like if they've brewed IPAs at the last brewery or whatever, and, and they were good, then they could take that malt bill and just swap out a few hops here and there and done deal changes the flavor completely or yeah tons of breweries will uh -huh. stick with the same grain bill for all their ipas uh -huh. and they'll just it's like a factorial they'll they'll use one hop for bittering and then two hops for kettle and then the next version they'll swap it so that they'll always have maybe a, a different hop um in a different category but they're still using the same three hops interesting so you figure it's a three by three factorial so there's nine different ways you can make an ipa with those hops going back to your organic and how you guys do that in, in i think you were telling me um before that the waste from that you guys do something with that is that correct what do you, you guys give it to somebody or do something yeah so um we have a farmer that uses yeah that's right a uh, subsistence farmer who uh -huh. uses as much organic practices as possible he's kind of an old school dude uh-huh so we, we give him all our spent grain 
Oh, okay. And and brewers typically get rid of their spent grain anyway, so that's not like anything really yeah. unique. But we have gone out of our way and, and tried to find farmers who would take our spent yeast, and um, whether it's from a like a Belgian beer, which is straight yeast, or an IPA that's got a lot of spent hops along with the yeast, and give it to them. And they found great results with how it accelerates the composting process and cuts down the time. Oh, wow. But they get so busy with their life that they can't always come pick up the spent hops and spent yeast and whatnot. And, and it's, it's a lot of it is, um, what do I want to say? So the application is logical, but the science behind it hasn't been conducted yet. So we keep reaching out to institutions, whether they're at, at the college level or nonprofits. <clears throat> we reach out to them and ask like, hey, can, can you take some of this material, spent yeast, whatever, um, chemically analyze it for NPK, micronutrients, all that stuff, and, and let's start figuring out ways where we can use that to replace either liquid fertilizer for the farmer or as a means to accelerate composting because, excuse me, whether, we're, whether you're an organic brewery or not, there's like a thousand breweries in California. That's a lot of spent yeast. It's a lot of spent liquid waste that goes down the drain that the right. municipality's wastewater treatment plant may not be able to handle. And we've got tons of farmers everywhere. And while I'd like everyone to be organic, the fact is if, if we could come up with a, with a process where a farmer knew, hey, if I'm gonna get X amount of this type of yeast, I just have to dilute it tenfold and that's all I need for my acre. Now we can have all these farmers getting free fertilizer from from all the breweries and the breweries can at least go to bed knowing hey we're dropping less stuff down the drain we still get charged that way from the water department i mean they just assume for every gallon of water you take you're creating a gallon of waste so there's nothing financially viable for this Mm -hmm. it's just more of like putting a feather in your hat for being a little bit more sustainable help farmers along the way yeah. and um, overall just reduce your carbon footprint. What would it take to get all these other breweries to do that? Uh, we need someone to come do the research first on, on just the chemical analyses of, oh. of the either non-hopped or hopped spent yeast uh-huh. and then figure out the application rates. It's a liquid format, so it's not that big of a deal. And, and honestly, it's not that big of a research project. If, 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 I, if we had the money and time, I could knock that out myself. And... Do you think that people, when they come to your brewery, they know that your beer's organic or they just go, man, this beer's killer? Or do you guys like let them know that, hey, this is an organic beer? Or? That's a, such a funny question because we have at least seven different ways people can see when they walk in the brewery <laughs> that we're organic. <laughs> yeah. And people still don't read signs. <laughs> sure, and and sure. I get it. Oh, for so sure. some people do find us because we're organic. Some people do yeah. find us because they, they know we have gluten free, gluten reduced products. Yeah. Some people find us because they know we have really good live music playing here. Yeah. Um, and some people find us because they've heard we've got great beer. Yeah. So it, it's like a, a, a myriad of ways people can find us. Um, and we just try and always be unique, like from our music selection that we play when you're here, the yeah. bands we have play here, the, mm-hmm. the beers we choose. And, um, you know, to get back to the recipe thing, sometimes you put a recipe mm-hmm. together and you have an idea of how it's going to taste and you, you just like, wow, this is not what I thought, but it's still good. Yeah. Um, for us, when we do a recipe, we have to have it already approved. So it's kind of, it's kind of hard to go into it. Mm-hmm. You just kind of have to pick a name and hopefully like it works. Okay. You can always change it later, but that recipe, when you, when you execute it, you know, all that different hops and whatnot, all the different grains, all that stuff, um, our organic uh, certifying agency has to audit it and, and approve that. So luckily at this point, a lot of the materials we use, grain and hops, they're already on our list of approved things we can use. So how we use them is up to us. You know, when you go to uh, different breweries um, all over the place, it seems like the alcohol content in uh, micro breweries and micro beers, it seems like it's it's, you know, higher than most uh, beers and is there a reason for that um oh, that's actually such a pet peeve of mine it's not even yeah. funny oh. so i'm gonna date myself here but 10 15 20 years ago ipas weren't seven seven two um uh-huh. a double ipa was above seven percent abv and 70 ibus a triple was greater than nine percent abv and 90 ibus 
when, now, you, when you say that for people who don't know, what does that mean? Like the ABV thing? Oh, ABV is alcohol by volume. Okay, cool. And uh, IBUs, international bitterness units. Uh huh. But somewhere along the way, and I think it happened in San Diego, and someone's going to crucify me by listening to this, but whatever. <laughs> you go to San Diego, and all these West Coast IPAs are so strong. Yeah. Seven, seven, two, seven, five. Like, man, you have one or two, and then, like, you're done. Yeah. We actually go out of our way to make sure that um, all, of our, all of our beers really are, are crushable. Some, like our Belgian Triple Quad, those are going to be big beers. To style, that's what they have to be. But our West Coast IPAs are typically around 6'3". Um, we have a double IPA called It Happened. It's 7'8". Uh, we have a double hazy, the one that won bronze us here is seven six. So, I mean, if you compare them, we're barely in the double IPA zone with our double IPAs. We just don't want something so big. We want something flavorful. You want three, four, especially when you got live music. Yeah. Um, it just makes a lot more sense. So yeah. somewhere along the way, I think San Diego brewers are like, oh, let's just try doing more. Let's just try doing more. Uh-huh. And you know, some. Brewers, uh, especially older style, always brewed to style. This is what the style guidelines say. This is how we're going to make it. But somewhere along the way, I think brewers just started saying, you know what? Screw it. Uh, we're not flowing style. This is the beer we want to make. Or it could just be that they put a recipe together, and that's what they got, and they ran with it. I've seen West Coast IPAs that were as murky as a hazy, but it had the bitterness of the whole yards of a West Coast. And I'm confused. Like, what are you presenting me here? If this is a West Coast, it, it should be a lot clearer. And yeah. you're giving me something that appears very hazy and just across the board, you know. Well, how so, do you, how do you or how do you get like? I mean, how can you like control that alcohol level? Like when you're when you're brewing a beer, how does that work? I mean, oh well, without getting too scientific. <laughs> yeah. So you, you know how much sugars um, per barrel you'll uh-huh. get from grain. So if you if you, if you know. You can either do mathematic like hand calculations, or you can use software. Uh-huh. Um, but but you can calculate in advance what your starting gravity is, and that just refers to how much sugars, whether they're fermentable or not, but how many sugars are in the the wort, which is the un the non fermented liquid, uh, the the sweet liquid. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can you can calculate how much you're going to start with. And then based on the style that you're making and where you want your beer to finish at, like how dry or, or um, uh, full body, you can kind of figure out where you're going to be. And if you've been brewing in your, in your system for a while, you know your mash efficiency, your brew house efficiency. So the, the, the calculation should be pretty spot on. And the only difference would be maybe if you're switching grains and maybe one grain has more fermentable sugars than the other one or they may be a little bit more plump and they have more sugars but um, other than that like if if you're constantly doing the same thing over and over and over again then it's easy to calculate for a new beer hey I'm going to start and I need X amount of grain to get I don't know starting gravity of like let's say 1062 and I want to end it at 1014 which for all of you listening right now, that's kind of what we shoot for for our hazies. But anyways, moving on. <laughs> 10, 14, 10, 16, 10, 18. But you can, from there, it's it's a simple mathematical equation, and um, it'll get you within a tenth of a point. No, a hundredth of a point of where you want to be. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that my podcast is about is, you know, entrepreneurs and, you know, starting their life and, and going for it. Obviously that's, you know, something that you have done and, um, uh, I'm really stoked that you have done that and you created this amazing uh, scene here in Ventura. I wanted to ask you, what's it like to win a bronze medal at a beer? And after, after all this stuff that you've been doing and brewing and, you know, seven years of, you know, working your ass off and then you win a medal, what's that like? Um, Were you just stoked out of your gourd, dude? No. But really? It, it's, it's like graduation. Like, you're, you're stoked. Yeah, yeah. But it's very anticlimactic. Really? It's like, okay, cool. We won. We got bronze. We placed. Great. Yeah. Well, why didn't we get gold? Okay. Like, <laughs> where are the notes? What do we need to do to get gold? <laughs> right, right, right. right. Um, but that, you know, that's out of a lot of breweries, man. You know? Yeah, no, we're, we're super stoked because yeah. people don't typically think of us as a place for IPAs or hazies. Yeah. But here we are at San Diego National Beer Competition. Yeah. And we got bronze that's, for a beer that... I mean, 
I'm stoked on it. It was a collab beer that we actually did with another organic brewery in San Diego called Protector. Uh -huh. And we've just kept maintaining the same recipe for the past two years. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's very, it was really, um, oh, what's the word? Not assuring. It was very, uh, I'm drawing a, a brain fart here. I apologize. It, okay. it, was, it was very, I guess, reassuring that with, the organic processes and what we have available to us, we can still make an award-winning beer. Yeah. Did you got, and you got another award for another beer too, you said? No, but we oh. got enough comments on the other ones to kind of fix it. And sometimes, you know, it, it's hard to figure out what category to put the beer in. Uh -huh. um, we got a coconut hazy IPA. It's, it's bomb. We call it coconuts. And it's like drinking liquid coconut. It's amazing. If you love coconut, you'll oh, love yeah. it. If you don't, you'll hate it. It's like, what category does that go into? It just can't go into a hazy IPA, and it can't go into, like, is it not a fruit? Is it coconut? Right. A, a nut? Like, it's a weird thing. So sometimes you have to submit to multiple categories to figure it out. Um, our Belgian-style Pilsner is a Pilsner made with some Belgian ingredients, Belgian yeast. It doesn't really fall into a normal category. So sometimes you just kind of, kind of submit a few times to figure out where it will sit. Mm -hmm. We've had some beer judges roll through and say, oh, this beer is amazing. You should submit it. Like, all right, cool, but what category? And like, oh, we don't know. Like, yeah, neither do we, which is why we haven't. Huh. Um, winning awards is cool, but the ultimate award that any business owner wants to get is the customer who comes in stoked on the vibe, stoked on the service, stoked on the, on the product, and then will come back again and again and again. And, you know, yeah. one, one of the things that, that I thought of when I started this company was kind of a make a sexier version of what happened to us so you know back in the day we always thought we were being healthy and, and eating salads and you know the meats and fish and all jazz and then one day we came across the omnivores dilemma and we read that book and it was just eye-opening like wow you know if you don't go organic you're, you're not truly being healthy to yourself you're just changing what toxins go into your body um and we got toxins going on our body all the time so it's not a big deal right yeah unless it is um so over time, we slowly converted from like salads being organic to like everything. It wasn't a process that happened overnight, but over that duration, that transition period, it, it took a lot of motivation, mm -hmm. right? The books, and then we watched like Food Inc. and all those other documentaries and yeah. just drove the message home. And I thought, well, one of the things that we can be doing with an organic brewery is to truly use every pint we sell as a way to convince people to go organic. Maybe they just go from you know, nothing to just doing salads and then later on they'll start bringing organic milk in or eggs and slowly but surely, you know, one day they open their, their pantry and their fridge and everything's organic or, or overwhelmingly the, the amount of stuff in there is, is organic and then I feel like we won. Yeah. Um, so we, you know, we stick true to the idea of, of being as clean as possible and and part of that was my connection to the ocean scuba diving surfing lots of surfing sailing surfing scuba diving the whole nine yards when you're connected to ocean whether or nature like for me it's the ocean i grew up a mile away from the beach but for those that grew up in the mountains and hiking and and getting away and being in nature and, and hearing and feeling that energy that's a really great way to connect and and awaken to the importance of keeping our environment clean and and user friendly if you will when you started your business did you uh, manifest everything that you're you have here that you did you see it before it happened and are you still manifesting things if if you are doing that or how do, how do you go about like keeping this thing growing and, and moving like you know I know you have distribution and you're you know getting in stores and stuff like that how does that play out in your mind as far as like you know, as a business owner, are you seeing these things before they happen or are you just kind of going with it? Mm. <laughs> so the whole manifesting thing is, I think, conceptually kind of cool, but I don't really, um, in my entire life, nothing has been linear and everything happens for a reason when it's time to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't really wait. I don't, I don't expend energy trying to put like I don't it's weird so I don't ha put out bad vibes yeah about oh we're gonna go bank or whatever but I'm not I 
I guess I let every day. So we have plans, mm -hmm. um, and we try and put forth the the energy to execute those plans. So we we meet our objective. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But I've learned along the way, like how we met, how I met TK. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of this is all just bloody random. Yeah. Like you, you couldn't even, you can't make it up. Yeah. But the moment I see an opening, I, I take it. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, it's like surfing. You know, you're, you're sitting in the lineup and a wave comes in. You turn around, you paddle into it, and you catch that wave. You really don't, a lot of times you don't know. You can go in and thinking, oh, I'm going to smash into all this stuff. But really, you just have to react to what that wave is going to give you. Mm -hmm. and, and you'll ride this wave and then kick out and wonder like, well, what just happened? Mm -hmm. Right, but but everyone else be hooting and hollering because you just yeah. scored a, a great wave, and and you go back, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. Well, if you're always, for me, I can't focus on. I have to focus on, on really just living and putting one foot in front of the other. You always hope for the best, but you always have to be prepared for the worst. Mm -hmm. um, how I thought this business was going to matriculate and how it is now is totally two different things, and and I'm okay with that. It's it's cool. It, I never once thought we would have developed the music program that we did the way we did. Uh -huh. um, I never once thought that we'd have made all the connections with all the musicians. I mean, we have a wall of just musical instruments now from musicians who live in town that come here frequently and, and sometimes they'll, if they had, actually it's kind of a funny story, but they used to not have instruments on the wall and I'd always ask them like, hey, do you, do you have your trumpet in your car? Can you come sit with the band? And um, I was going to get the musicians like lockers so they can go in the back and <laughs> grab it like they just clocked in for work, right? Awesome. And uh, <laughs> one, one musician, a good friend of mine, Max, he's, yeah. you know, he wanted it mounted. And, and so now this happened, right? And we yeah. just kind of made it work with what wall space we have. But it wasn't planned out. Like I never thought that was happening. I never thought we'd be friends with nationally touring musicians, booking agents, people that want to come here to, to see the live music who themselves are in big bands like I, I just didn't see it happening but once it starts to happen you run with it yeah um i hate to say that i'm, I'm really a guy of chance because i do plan things out yeah try to be very methodical but at the end of the day life is funny and if if you're trying to go in door one and, and it's not opening but door three is like fuck door one just hit door three really hard and yeah and maybe you could back door into door one if not maybe it wasn't meant to be who cares just keep going forward and then maybe a year later you can get back in i mean we just got into vaughn's our first Vaughn's yeah, delivery was on awesome. Friday, and it took us over three years of trying, forgetting about it, trying, forgetting about it, and then we finally got in. Um, and what does that mean for you guys? I mean, does that mean like you're in Vaughn's like locally, or Vaughn's all over the place, or how? Ah, uh, yeah. So, so we're in, we're getting into all the local stores nice. week over week, and if we do well there, then we'll get into oh, okay. uh, surrounding counties, and then it just really becomes. Um, how well we can maintain distribution. And we had a distribution deal in LA uh, for a while. It really didn't end well, and we, we got out of that. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Uh, we learned a lot. Yeah. So the next time we'd have more questions and hopefully be able to handle it better. Um, it's a really interesting time to be in the in the beer industry in general, or, or the alcohol industry. You just hear left and right of. Um, sales to like grocery stores and whatnot going down pubs throughout the world are closing down germany england all these places you thought like they, this would never happen because beer is so part of their culture but left and right it, things are changing it's a very dynamic situation in, <laughs> um, in business you know one of the things that i being a business owner myself is um adapting adapting to different things and that's kind of what you're you were just saying is like you I had no idea that I would be involved with all these musicians and all that and I think you know some good advice for people getting into business is like you know going with the flow which is exactly what you said right yeah it's like you got to go with the flow and be open to change right yeah be a salmon yeah yeah it's like it's super important to to be able to do other things and change and I think a lot of businesses that I've seen over the years that don't adapt and don't change or stuck in their old ways seem to sometimes go out of business, you know? 
Yeah, and you know, anyone that's in business knows that just because you adapt doesn't mean you won't go out of business too. Yeah, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> there can only be so many winners. Yeah, yeah. And um, what makes your business successful? Do you think? Well, one of the things we do is we keep it lean and mean. Um, as as a former marine, I'd like lean, well trained, well trained teams. And we do have a really good team that they don't need a whole lot of instruction. Yeah. Uh, they know what to do in certain cir- circumstances, and and that's great. Um, we're, we're still owner operators. Yeah. So we we do enjoy being here and hanging out with our friends, our regulars, the live music, all that stuff. Um, but we have a, a high attention to detail. Mm-hmm. From how we pour beers, bathroom cleanliness, how we handle yeah. certain situations, it's right. um, it's different than most, and I'm okay with that, um, because at the end of the day, we run this exactly how we'd want it ran if we went into someone else's business. Nice. So I figure since we're here, if it if it is good enough for us, it should be good enough for everyone. Absolutely. Do you find that, um, you know, keeping it lean and mean is, is a good thing? Like for, I know you work your ass off cause I, I've seen you here early in the morning as I'm driving by. Sometimes I'll see you here. So describe, like describe for people out there, like a lot of people don't know how hard entrepreneurs work, but describe like your day, like, you know, what you do, like, like when you come in on say Monday or Tuesday or whatever, you know, what, what is it like for you? Well, n- no two days are the same. Uh-huh. And as a small business owner, you should be prepared to work seven days. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and we do. Yeah, yeah. Um, even on our, our days off, there's a certain band. We know we got to be here because all hands on deck. And yeah, yeah. maybe I just kind of do the bouncing thing. Oh. Um, but you should enjoy it. So, you yeah. know, for us, I think the key is to have it structured with flexibility. Mm-hmm. So you know, you know Monday through Wednesday I, I do sales, um, and meaning and, like you go around and get do sales at the different places and stuff like the like bars and everything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then that's actually I, I find that quite fun to it's fun, yeah. talk to the bar managers, yeah. the the restaurant owners, all that stuff, and and it's one you get to shoot the shit and yeah. and um, kind of see how their industries are going too, and then you can extrapolate backwards what I'm seeing. Mm-hmm. So I'm going out and I can get in one day, 15 different stops, whether it's a restaurant, bar, retail, um, like grocery store, bar or yeah. store, whatever. And you get everyone's different opinion on how business is and do that over time. You don't yeah. need the news station cause yeah. that's not local, but local, you get a really good strong feel for how the industry's doing. Um, what's moving, what's not moving. And so for me, it's like, okay, well if, if product a, is the style that you want to move like I've got these two why don't you try one of these two let's let's take a handle or whatnot um, and then Thursday Friday is, is brew day or admin if I'm not brewing um, we do deliveries on Thursday and Friday and I got a seller operator delivery driver who does all that stuff and the, the nice thing is there's there's room for us to grow the business but you know, if the swell is firing and, and we want to go disappear for a few hours, I know I got two and a half hours from the time I load the van to go surf to the time I need to be back at the brewery to go do work or whatever. Yeah. And sometimes that's all you need is two hours to go in and out. Sure. Um, yeah. But you could fit it in. So it is this business is a, is a lifestyle business mm-hmm. because, well, one, I, I'm we're growing, but I, I still don't want to work too much. We did that for like five years and the pandemic really taught us to take some time out for ourselves. Um, I'm not doing double or triple sessions like I used to do, but if I can get in the water two, three times a week, three, four times a week, cool. Um, work out and train all that stuff. It just, just good for me. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, so the, the schedule, has to be somewhat flexible to allow that to happen and there's consequences for that right so mm-hmm. if i go surf on a monday and i go at seven and i get out and i'm ready to go by nine nine thirty i may have already missed two accounts so now my monday is going to be a little longer or maybe i just you know send a text or push that work over on tuesday mm-hmm. likewise maybe i have to do that work saturday or sunday 
uh, especially as admin. So you just kind of learn. Um, and I, I did this as an extension agent for University of Hawaii Sea Grant. I did this in grad school too. You just prioritize. And, and the admin stuff you can always do late at night. Mm-hmm. You, know, you could send an email Sunday night at, at nine. They'll get to it when they get to it. But at least you send it out, it's, it's, it's done. And um, that's that. And if that means you can blow off four or five hours in a day, yeah. have at it. How did you score this place? Like this used, this used to be like, a, I remember, was it a Firestone garage or? What was it like? No, this was uh, built in 1930 for Goodyear. Goodyear, It was their yeah, first tire right. store. It was the yeah. second tire store in, in all of Southern California. Yeah. First one was La Brea in 1928. And um, again, going back to that whole like random yeah. meant to be stuff, we were looking at a location um, on the other side of town in a smaller location at the harbor. Mm-hmm. And we got a call from call email from uh, visit ventura and uh we were told hey there's a spot that's opening and the landlord is interested in, in putting a concept together are you interested and i thought oh yeah we've seen this building a lot driving through downtown that's um awesome, and and we i always thought like oh this would be a cool spot to set up a brewery it's it's a very classic 1930s all brick um tire repair store building and in those days like they, they literally have an article that was published in some national newspaper about the appropriate design for a tire repair store in the early 1900s so at this point you know they got the cars rolling and, and they need this level of infrastructure and it was an L so in this case yeah. you know we have a it's a big L building and in the center is our parking lot patio um, I mean it's it had a lot of challenges with it but it just so happened that when, it, when I made that connection with the landlord and we talked a little bit and he was stoked on the idea he yeah. literally turned down Starbucks and someone else really? to do something like this and it still is huh. one of his favorite projects huh. okay so this is this is kind of cool um, you know back uh, when I w- when I was playing a lot I was playing in a band uh, you know I, I have a band now called Stoneflies but you know, what's really cool is when somebody comes up and they say, hey, man, I, I met my wife at your show, you know, and these are our kids and they know your songs. You know, that's pretty that's awesome. awesome. It's pretty awesome, right? Yeah, yeah. So imagine, imagine since you've opened up this place. It's happened twice already. Yeah. <laughs> how many, how many people or how just, just the happiness that you brought people to their lives to the amount of people that have met each other, made friends, seen bands that they never would have seen. Yeah. You know, all that. I mean, how cool is that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's you that whole I mean? idea of building a community. Yeah. Um, and just being a part of the community. Yeah. So we, we've had two different couples that have met here on blind dates. No that way. got engaged here. No way. And have had kids. They didn't get married here. We've had people hold wedding an- or wedding receptions and stuff like that. Yeah. But in this case, only two, two times have they started from a blind date to getting engaged and they both times they met here on their blind date both times they got engaged here and then Sick. both times they got married moved to texas like i don't know if that's what we end up doing like i don't think we're like <laughs> but it just happened that way and yeah. then there's a ton of times like during the pandemic we had um we started having live music we we were fortunate to have um a rise roots play here solo it was just cream and and chris and we we did it as best as we could to to be compliant with the COVID rules, which were totally asinine, but nonetheless, we, we did our best, and um, it's a little challenging. We got shit from some people because they wanted to sit certain spots, like, no, everyone's got to be seated, there's no dancing, you know, those weird yeah. days. <laughs> and when people left, I mean, it literally got to the point where I was like, hey, dude, there's two of you, and there's a four top over there with one person, you're going to go make a friend. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, there's no place for you to sit. Yeah. Uh, you're outside, you should be fine, if you yeah. don't feel fine, like, wear your mask, whatever. And, and so many people made friends that night. So many people were yeah. crying. Like, we haven't seen live music in forever because of the pandemic. And, and they're crying. Like, wow, this is really yeah, intense. Right. Yeah. And then um, it just music is, is such a – music and beer go hand-to-hand. They're both ways to build a community. They're both ways to provide people release from their daily lives, to rejuvenate and kind of just restoke themselves for the next challenge in their life. And, uh, I mean, all the bands we've had here – yeah, let's talk about that. It's it's been amazing. Like we started with a few bands inside. Yeah. Um, 
I had a certain idea and, and our, our, our beloved friend TK had a, sorry. No worries. He had a different idea and we just redid the entire taste room to what it is now. Yeah. Um, when you're talking about sound wise and sound wise, where the wow. band goes, where the TV goes, the whole <laughs> yards, it was, it was actually so much more strategic. It just, yeah, you know, I'm not an audio engineer and he yeah. was, yeah. yeah. Um, and then, you know, we did the booking ourselves for a while, bringing in bands and most of it was inside. Yeah. <clears throat> and I didn't really listen to TK as much then as I do now. Uh-huh. <laughs> so we have a, we totally have a different format, but, you know, when we opened up, the, the city wouldn't give us any more than a 500 square foot outside patio. And it was like fighting tooth and nail to get this thing. The pandemic enabled us to really open up and we took over another 1500 square feet so we could start having live music outside. And- um, Makes sense. Yeah it, yeah, it totally does. Um, yeah. We, we had some big bands play inside, but really that the big bands are outside and and inside is supposed to be small, like a sugar shack style. Yeah, oh so yeah. Some bands can swing it. Other bands are stuck in their ways. They don't want to do it. And it gets a little too chaotic, but, um, you know. It's really cool. It's like a broken down kind of acoustic type vibe in the inside. Yeah. Right, yeah. It should be totally intimate to draw people in. Yeah. And outside's the party vibe. Dancing, sure. the whole nine yards. Um, I mean, you remember, we had we had you guys play here yeah. a couple Halloweens ago, and that was a rager. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Um, so awesome. So I guess we just took advantage of what we had available and, and how much drama do I want to deal with. So now we work with Mad Face Marketing to do a lot of our bookings. He's got a solid one sheet that we worked and fine tuned. I don't have to deal with that drama. Um, I, I still bring on some bands on my own, uh, but I don't have to focus on that because that's, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a tap room thing, but it's not tap room ops it's not sales and i got too many things other to handle with um and we've just developed you know, we we me i am very passionate about reggae yeah, yeah i've lived in the caribbean i've lived in the south pacific I've, I've spent tons of time surfing hawaii um and in that that caribbean and pacific islander roots vibe is, is awesome so we play a lot of that here i think it's very appropriate and it kind of sets like a nice mellow mood so you can hang out and and relax enjoy some beers but also brings in some really good music. Yeah, it does. That brings in more good music. That brings yeah. in more good music, and it's cool when people say like, "Oh, your home base." It's like, oh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. We we tease that we should have changed the name to Launching Pad Brewing Company because there's so <laughs> many either food trucks or bands that start here and then just blow up. Yeah. And go on to bigger venues. We're only we're only so big, right? Sure. Um, so I get it. Some at some point you you outgrow. Yeah. Home. Um, but it's just so cool to be able to say like, yeah, that happened here. That happened here. Mm -hmm. Who's uh, who's some of the upcoming bands that you really enjoy that are, are playing at your place now? I know One People is pretty amazing. One People's legit. Um, I'm yeah. really happy to see their growth. Yeah. Uh, I think they've, they've got good potential to, to blow up and go next level. I consider yeah. them like the Ayaterra of Ventura. Uh -huh. The heavy hitters, I've loved them since day one. Um, Maury and Bo have that nice, I mean, Maury being a, an Islander, he's got that wonderful tonality in, in those harmonies and, and Bo as well. Yeah. They have full horn section. I love horns. Yeah, yeah. Being Mexican, growing up listening to mariachis and whatnot, I love horns. I love ska, uh -huh. Uh -huh. mariachis, reggae. It's, it's a horn <laughs> thing, right? And that upbeat tempo. Yeah. Uh, they kill it. Jacob Marquez and Good Vibes have been getting better. I mean, Jacob used to play here. Doesn't Jacob play with every band? Yeah, and he plays drums and he and he plays guitar. He sings. And yeah, he, I mean he he's a really talented musician, man. He is, yeah. and and the fact that so he used to be in a band called After the Smoke. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, and they played here once, and it was a disaster. They're just so loud. And I, I told <laughs> I told Jacob I can't do this again, dude. But I'll I'll have you here every month and, and support you wherever I can. And so we did, solo, just by himself. Huh? Yeah, and I remember during the pandemic, he hits me up. He's like, Hey, John. And he'd been playing solo once a month, just keeping it a routine. It's like, hey, John, do you mind if next, next month I, I can bring in my band? I'm like, whoa, 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 you're so good alone, dude. Like, <laughs> do you really want to do this? And he brought in the band. I had Chongo and Mark. And it's like, wow, these guys are sick. Add more. That's awesome. Um, we got Heavy Rotation, which is uh, Jacob's the drummer in that band. 
and that's more Pacific Island reggae vibe, which is cool. Yeah. A lot of harmonies. Yule has a great voice. Doesn't he? Um, doesn't Jacob play drums in the Heavy Hitters too? He does. Yeah. He does. <laughs> yeah. And he's learned a lot. His drumming's gotten so good. Yeah. Um, I watched him play at uh, Spencer McKenzie's Throwdown. With, oh yeah. With the Heavy Hitters, and yeah. I was like, I didn't even know you played drums. Yeah. And uh, I was like, damn, he's good, man. Yeah. yeah. Um, We've had this band Mestizo Beat roll through here a few times. Oh, yeah. Afro-Cuban funk. Yeah. They're fantastic. Are they? Um, and that was just like uh, something that we did because our buddy Max, he's in that band. Oh, yeah. Max is in that band. Yeah. That's yeah. where I've heard of him. Okay. So they rolled him through last year, just, you know, once a quarter, something like that, kind of build yeah. a following. Um, yeah. It's That's actually a genre that we don't have a lot of here in Ventura. Ventura has a lot of reggae, a lot of ska. What, what kind of music are they? It's Afro? Afro-Cuban funk. Or Afro Cuban oh. jazz. Oh, cool. Yeah, they're they're solid. Um, we like you guys, Stoneflies. Thanks, you guys man. were like the OG ska band. I mean, thanks, man. So the thing that I thought was so cool is that one day, uh, TK was here watching one people play, and it was TK's first time watching them play, and he was super super pumped. Uh-huh. On the other side of that coin, some of the band members for one people knew TK was here and they're like oh man this is so rad that TK's here yeah it was like a like a mutual respect and I think that's one of the coolest things when band members or full bands roll in yeah to listen to another band where you can be like dude you're all competing for for playing time but you all look up to each other and respect each other and it's like there's a business competition side but there's also that respect and that collab side and I thought that was really special yeah Um, you know it's what when we play and whenever they play, I try to go see one people. Whenever I'm in town, I try to go see them or any other bands that I that I know are playing. But I'll tell you, man, uh, one people and all those dudes are, are at our shows a lot, you know, supporting us um, when we play and stuff. It's so cool. It and is. that's the way it's supposed to be. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, and those dudes are freaking awesome, man. Super stoked on their uh, their sound and their show. Yeah, you know, um, seen him a bunch, bunch of times now, but that's so cool, man. I mean, it's created a little music scene for sure. It, it has, and there's only a few spots. Like when we started this, we had so much live music. It got to the point where like, oh man, so much drama. Like, maybe we can like slow down a little bit, right? Yeah. But no one else was doing it, and then Tony started doing it. Yeah. And then the six started doing it, right. and it's like, oh well, maybe we lost our seat at the table. And I thought, no. No. Nope. M- maybe our job was just to start this. And now that everyone else sees how to make this work, the reggae scene, cool. Now let's focus on another genre. I like bluegrass. Yes. Um, and we got a lot of bluegrass out here, but how to get that funneling through here. Yep. I love jam band stuff. Yep. Um, so it's really just combining um, our passions with, with the brewery and diversifying so that yeah. you know, if we're all fighting to get the same four or five bands to play, like there's a saturation effect and for sure we all end up being losers yeah um and at a certain point all these bands need to start playing out of town to build that following if they want to go next level yeah uh some like one people i think they're small enough of a group and they're they have less commitments where they could say you know what we're going to sacrifice next year just go on tour and, yeah. and sub- do all this local or the support for these other big guys and, and hopefully get Mm-hmm. invited Cali Roots and kind of blow up Kyle Smith style yeah yeah um, lean so. and mean you know yeah I've, I've walked in enough establishments and seen a ton of people on, on payroll but it's like you're not really doing anything and I'm I'm an older dude so I've, I've got like an older mindset of, of how things get done I, I do just appreciate a, a well trained lean team mm-hmm. um, you know sometimes they'll call off sick and then you gotta do double duty or something like that but it's easier yeah. because the other thing we like to do is keep it family style. So, um, I mean, staff know they're part of the team. Um, so we don't always hug it out, but we hug all our friends, regulars. They do too. Uh, we treat the fans just like family too. stoke them out. We're stoked they're here. And even though there's a set on of jazz, we're still stoked they're here and, and just try and make it feel everyone feel welcomed. Like they're in a backyard party. Nice. I um, love it. And Ventura's such a slow beach town. Like I think that's the, the right way to do it. Yeah. If you were to recommend one of your beers to a new customer coming in, what, which beer would it be? 
It depends on the customer. Yeah. We always <laughs> just ask, what do you normally drink? Uh -huh. What are you in the mood for? And then from that, I could break down. It's either one beer or three beers. Uh -huh. um, and that's kind of how it goes because one, you know, it's, it's kind of overwhelming when you walk into a tap room. And you, you guys see have like, a lot of beers. <laughs> yeah, we have, uh, I think we have 11 beers, two fruited seltzers, and one mocktail. Uh -huh. So, I mean, three years ago, making a seltzer, no way. Wouldn't do yeah. it. Now we're just totally embracing it. They're, they're, the way we make them are delicious. Yeah. Uh, making a mocktail, are you kidding me? I never would have thought of that this time last year. What's a mocktail? Essentially, it's a cocktail without alcohol. Oh, okay. Got it. So, um, you know, NA is big with people, and we don't have the infrastructure to make an NA beer. Uh -huh. So we make a mocktail. And then we've learned that, okay, we'll make the mocktail, and if it's good, maybe it graduates to a hard seltzer, and then we come up with a different mocktail. So we don't have a, the same, uh, like a mocktail and the same seltzer on it. It could be kind of confusing, get people, maybe they have the, the, the hard alcohol when they were supposed to go NA. Um, just makes it fun. We're working on a, a ranch water, prickly pear ranch water one right now. And um, it just goes back to that whole adaptability. But yeah, typically it is daunting and you see all these beers. So we have to figure out what you're in the mood for. Or if we've seen the person just ordered food from the taco truck, we just ask, what did you order? Like, oh, you ordered that? Okay. These would be really good pairings. No way. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. Okay. So... Let me rephrase that question. What's your best-selling, most popular beer? Oh, geez. There's a tie. Oh, is there? So Coconuts really? crushes it. Really? Awesome. No one makes a Coconut Hazy. Um, huh. Not in the area. I mean, a really good Coconut Hazy that inspired us to make Coconuts was Green Cheeks um, Cocoa Hut. It's a Coconut Milkshake Hazy IPA from green cheek delicious but too much lactose the next day that's that's not fun um so we decided to make it without the lactose which means you know if you're vegan it's safe for you too mm -hmm. um and it's like if you love coconut it's just it's hard not to crush this beer and it's a six three so it's easy to have three four yeah um we have a hard seltzer made with real organic alfonso mangoes it tastes like a mango mimosa we call it mosa that crushes it too. I mean, it's delicious. Um, I've seen guys, girls, all age groups just love that. If you love mangoes, game over. It's fantastic. Um, but we also have like uh, hazies that taste like grapefruit, pineapple, our double hazy. Um, sunrises are blonde. So if someone likes 805 or blondes, there you go. Mm -hmm. Cheater 5, our Pilsner. What's the uh, name of the one we're drinking right now? We're drinking Cheater 5. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. It's always a good one, yeah. Um, one last question. If you could give advice to somebody that wants to become a, a brewer and you know open up a brewery, what, what advice would you give them? I think the first thing I'd tell them is to really reflect as to whether you want to run a business uh -huh. or operate a department in a business. Okay. Because it's, it's really hard sometimes to to separate the booking, bookkeeping side of things. Like, you're like, oh, this, this is going to be amazing. And then you start doing the math, like, holy shit, this is going to be really expensive. I don't know if we can sell this, right? Yeah, right. Hey, it's hard to do that separation. Yeah. Sometimes you just got to say, like, fuck it, we're just making it. Yeah. Or, now nah, we're not, this, this won't end well. Um, I think, so I, I, did a, I did a period of time working at Crazy Mountain Brewing Company as an intern. And, and oh, did you? Okay. The founder, CEO, Kevin, he gave me some good advice. The whole point of this internship was to learn as much as I could yeah, um, about every facet. And he was like, you know what? No matter what, you'll never know enough. You just have to know, you just <laughs> have to know enough to be willing to do it. Um, and a brewer, I mean, I think hands down in this day and age, you have to be well capitalized. You need to be able to come in with a couple million. Um, brewing is, is very expensive. I mean, yeah. you're buying a lot of stainless steel and whatnot. Yeah, right. And people forget, like, when you release a beer, you may have purchased all those ingredients like a month, two months ago. For us, when we make an IPA, 
it has to lager for at least three weeks before we could transfer and package it. So from beginning to end, there's like um, yeah, it's five, amazing. six weeks from the time we brew the beer to the time it's packaged and ready to be sold. Really? So six weeks. That's, I mean, there's there's a huge lag time. Yeah. Um, and it's it's that paradigm with manufacturing. You're yeah. you're buying two months of you're buying ingredients for like two months of downtime before you can pay it off. So there's a lot of it's uh, working capital that you need. And I think a lot of us always forget like, well, we'll make it up in the next month. It's like, it's always good to make sure you're, you're well capitalized. Um, it's a lot like running your household finances. Mm-hmm. And running your household finances should be a lot like running a business. Mm-hmm. You should be well capitalized, a couple months of emergency money just in case shit hits the fan. Mm-hmm. And, and things do. In our industry, you could be doing great and then all of a sudden you get bad weather for three weeks and then it just right. doesn't affect us it affects all of our accounts yeah and then no one's buying beer it's like oh geez right you know um it's everybody and and honestly it's a it's an experience to be drinking beer and and so as the industry changes the flexibility is key like you mentioned mm-hmm. um when we first opened, we had like nine people working the bar, like so many. Really? It was crazy. I, I thought I knew how to run it uh-huh. um, and the right math, and, and you didn't, we didn't need that many people. Yeah, yeah. So just having a good, well-trained team that you can learn to trust mm-hmm. because they can perform mm-hmm. is key. But you don't, I think one of the, the misnomers is that we need a big team like oh we've got 20 percent staff like i mean you, you don't mm-hmm. need a big team as you grow you need to add more people but you know the the a small lean team i think is a good way to go being well capitalized is smart um and one thing i really had a hard time grasping especially when we first opened was the fact that it was okay for me to go surf or just screw off i thought no i have to keep doing these things i have to be focusing on work it's like no you you don't like you really do need to the amount of work that i get done when i'm out surfing is hilarious i'll meet people i've i've had um reps and 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 bar managers and whatnot who Normally, I would meet a certain day at their establishment and surf fire. I was like, I'm going surfing. And they're all out surfing, too. Yeah. Next thing you know, I get a second handle or or, or more. Um, uh, I get put higher up on the totem pole because we have these connections. It's yeah. like golfing, but I, I don't, I'm not a golfer. I, yeah. I never will golf. Yeah. I golfed once. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a pretty fit dude. Yeah. I golfed once with my lawyer. And that next day, I was sore in parts all over my body. <laughs> You're using that had, stuff, yeah. It was horrible. Yeah. I'm like, wait a minute. You know, I'm looking at my lawyer. I was like, D- you, you are not in shape. Like, <laughs> how am I hurting like this? This is not fun. Yeah. Um, you, you definitely have to take time for yourself. Yeah. What, uh, where can people find you if they want to, you know, if they come to Ventura or they want to see you online or, you know, socials or anything like that? Where do they find you? Yeah, so on social on social media we're leashless brewing. Um, dot com. Leashlessbrewing dot com. So our, our website's leashlessbrewing.com. dot com. Okay. And from there you could access our, our events calendar. Nice. You can access our online store, so we can ship to anyone in California. You just got to go to the website leashless to go, but you could uh, access that straight off the website. Uh huh. Um, and from there we also have like a, a beer map finder, so you could see what restaurants, bars, grocery stores carry us. Oh. Which is pretty cool. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, we try and keep it as simple as possible. And then on like uh, the socials, like Instagram and stuff like that? Instagram, yeah. it's all Leashless Brewing. Facebook, Leashless Brewing. We don't really okay. do Twitter or X or whatever it is. Or yeah. We haven't yeah. gotten to TikTok yet. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. and awesome. uh, Right on, man. Well, cheers, buddy. Cheers. Thanks, Guy, for, Thanks for inviting being me in this yeah, podcast. Yeah. It's a really awesome time. Thank you very much for being on the podcast and sharing your story. And uh, you know, this will be coming out soon. I'm stoked. And I can't wait to have Stone Flies in whatever capacity. That we'll be here. Come back and um, we'll be back then. Just got to get things going. Yeah.
Yeah. All right, buddy. Well, thanks, man. We'll talk soon. Thanks, guy. And cheers, everyone. Thanks for listening to this podcast. Thanks, man. It's a guy jeans podcast.